a wheel to wrap my cheeks to. Creating a system that is extractive, right? That mm. is destructive towards this natural ecosystem in service of itself. What if we design the system that is collaborative, that is um, regenerative, that reinforces these systems and acknowledges them as intertwined? and as being the same even. And so we do that through tokenization. We do that to actually investing in building food forests, investing in, in community through grants, building a circular economic model that connects a local crypto token mm. with actual needs of people on the ground, whether that's having access to food, having access to programs or, or, or maybe funding for projects that actually empower people. And then bringing that all together, bringing the community together to celebrate each other, but also also to support and reinforce and lift each other up in a way that builds up on the work already been done. Yo, what is poppin' Refi Nation? John Ellison here from Refi Dow, bringing another episode of Refi Podcast. Today, we welcome a very good friend of mine, Gilberto Morisha, the head of impact, equity, and inclusion at Colectivo. In today's show, we touch a little bit on the work that Colectivo is doing on the ground in Curaçao from Gilberto's perspective being born and raised in Curaçao, now living in the Amsterdam, and really looking at regeneration from a holistic perspective, understanding the role that people play in this complex system that we are architecting. We unpack the term diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice as a part of this broader discovery of where are we actually headed? What are we regenerating for? And what's the end state of this mission on which we are all embarking together? We go pretty deep. Some of the conversations hits a little hard, but definitely for me, I've been really open to this quiet investigation of looking deeper into my own motivations, my own biases, and my own shadows. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Let us know what you think. It'd be great to share with any friends that you think would resonate with this message. And we'll see you on the other side. Gilberto, welcome to Lisbon, my friend. So good to have you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. It's such a joy to see you in real life for once, you know? <laughs> We're real people, man. We're not just digital portraits of ourselves stuck in like a on a, on a, on a magical movie box. <laughs> well, most of the time we are, but now yes. we get to cuddle, we get to sing, we get to have food together. So thanks for coming all the way out, man. Thank you for having me. Dude, I'm excited to jump into this space today. I feel like this is a, a long time coming, this conversation. Um... And yeah, man, there's some there's some serious territory to walk through. But I feel like before we go, it'd be really nice to just give ourselves a couple of minutes to center. We'd like to open some of our podcasts, especially the in-person ones with a little meditation. You down to give us two minutes and Definitely. go there? Let's do it, man. Let's do it. So yeah, just an invitation for anybody listening. Um, take two minutes out of your day to yeah find a place to seat um, or just keep washing your dishes. And um, yeah. Take a moment to close your eyes and find your breath. Feeling a slow, steady wave of inhalation and exhalation. the rising and falling of your chest. Allowing the weight of gravity to pull you down towards the earth. Feet on the floor, your seat in a chair. This massive spinning ball of life drawing you home. Grounding you into this place, in this moment, in this time. With every breath, recognizing this incredible gift of life.
You can imagine the thousands of listeners scattered all across the world. Different expressions of regeneration. Different beliefs. Different skills. Unified by this vision of a future where people on the planet can live together in harmony. Inviting us all to inquire what is my unique gift to this symphony of regeneration. Thanks, man. And we're back. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious how you'd answer that question, Gilberto. For those who don't know you, like, what are you here to do, man? What's your gift? What's your contribution to this amazing movement that we're building together? So, that's a good question. I think, I think often we describe ourselves with the positions that we have, right? What we do. So, mm. currently, I'm head of impact, equity, and inclusion for Colectivo. Mm. Um, I see myself as a community builder. I see myself as contributing to building an ecosystem um, that empowers and strengthens communities into becoming their full selves, into mm. really becoming one with their environment, one with each other, mm. and kind of turning the current global status quo upside down. Mm. I think my work here in this regenerative finance space is to kind of be that voice that inspires people, but also um, provides these insights that hold people accountable in a way that awakens them to incongruencies mm. or um, lack of harmony within what we're saying and what we're doing. Yeah. Um, I think often we come in, within, within these spaces with a lot of good intentions, right? But if we do not question why we're doing things, mm. um, we can create things that either benefit nobody or harm people. And so my role is to kind of help guide us to that path where we're building something that is truly regenerative, right? Mm. Not just in word, but also in being, in doing, in, in living. And yeah, like, I mean, I can add tons of other things to that, but I think um, the gist of it is that we invest in community involvement. I invest in, in, in engagement and lifting people up mm. and... Um, allowing people to see themselves clearly, but also allowing them to see what is the impact of the work that I'm really doing. Yeah. Um, and not just in a, in a measurable sense, right? But um, what is the impact that it has for the soul of the community, the heart of the community? And what are we really building for tomorrow, today? Mm. Mm. Yeah, there's so much to unpack there. And I think it's interesting, um, you know, Collectivo giving this particular title or you giving this title around impact, equity, and inclusion, that these are all tied together into one conscious stream of work. And I'd love to unpack kind of why those things sit together side by side and how you approach it. But just wanted to lay a bit of a foundation for those who don't know Collectivo. So we obviously had Luke and Pat on the show last season. Uh, we've got an amazing conversation with Andy Kirchner, who's actually sent us a postcard, which I absolutely love, Andy. We love Andy. Massive shout out Stay to Andy weird. Kirchner, uh, the Recycled Pirates. Such a powerful story. Um, yeah, but just like laying down, you know, 10,000 foot view, how would you describe the work of Collectivo in Curaçao for somebody who has no idea what you guys are up to? So... Whenever I describe it, I say we're reinventing the way an economy works. Mm -hmm. So what would the world look like if our economy was founded on well-being and founded on the regeneration of nature and of communities and the restoration of our bonds mm -hmm. with nature and with each other? Um, and to, to make it even more in-depth, I would say mm -hmm. we're designing currency, we're designing a monetary and economic system that is founded on the well-being of ecosystems, whether that's a food forest or a mangrove or a coral reef. You know, 
these are the things that found and, and, and protect our being, our existing, without any of these natural resources. I mean, they're not even resources. They're, they're living organisms yeah. within that we coexist. But without them, we wouldn't we exist wouldn't because there is yeah. this interconnection that is at the foundation, the, the real reality, right? Because mm. there's like there's a lot of levels of reality. We have our fake realities where we've designed, we've created an economic system in this world, right? Um, mm. Global capitalism. But it, it, it relies on the existence of these natural realities to exist, to continue to propagate. And instead of creating an, a system that is extractive, right, that... Mm. that um, is destructive towards this natural ecosystem in service of itself. What if we design the system that is collaborative, that is um, regenerative, that reinforces these systems and acknowledges mm. them as intertwined and as being the same even? And so we do that through tokenization. We do that to actually investing in building food forests, investing in in community through grants, mm. um, building a circular economic model that connects um, local local um, crypto token mm. with actual needs of people on the ground. Whether that's having access to food, having access to um, um, programs, or, or, or maybe funding for projects that actually empower people. And then bringing that all together, bringing the community together to celebrate each other, but also to, to, to support and reinforce and lift each other up in a way that builds up on the work that has already been, already been done. Mm. Not just, you know, I'm not just competing with you. We are collaborating and we're building something with a purpose for the future in mind, in our hearts, and we manifest that into reality. I think mm, that mm. kind of connects to what Colectivo is doing. Obviously, we call it public goods, right? Sure, sure. But it's not just about um, a public good in a, in a disconnected sense, right? It's about um, what is the good for all of us together and, mm. and that... Even the private, even the even the personal, is not totally disconnected from from the whole. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think as a kind of a recap, I you know love this image of Curacao as an island state yeah. that has you know so much dependency on economies outside and has been really subjected to some pretty punitive um, debt measures from a sovereign debt structure, obviously through the pandemic and even before. And the fact that you guys have built a local community currency pegged to the value of the local um, gilder, as it's called, but is backed by nature and people can access this currency through mobile phones to pay for everyday goods and services and to get involved in the projects, the food forests, the you know coral reef restoration. I think this really is um, you know, an incredibly full spectrum experiment because you guys are obviously managing natural capital on one side, the data flows and how to actually measure and monitor and verify yeah. that health of living ecosystems alongside, you know, the community and the uh, currency that supports an economic yeah. development within that within that space. And so, yeah, super big fans of what you guys are doing. And I think I'd love to really look more specifically in this conversation around like your unique lens and contribution into yeah. this space. I first came familiar with this term of, um, you know, JEDI or DEI and J actually through John X at Toucan when I was first doing the podcast. Mm. And, you know, full confession came into this uh, very new, you know, new to climate, new to crypto. I was very curious wanted to learn and we started putting together our season one lineup of guests and John was just like bro like these are all just white dudes <laughs> like what are you doing yeah and and it was total lack of awareness it wasn't my intention it's just what surfaced yeah and so I'd love for you to unpack kind of the fundamentals of you know whatever acronym you want to choose and why this is so important for this space and yeah lay down the land landscape and then we can kind of dive into it because I know there's so many misconceptions in this space of how this is interpreted oh my and, god yeah so <laughs> where do we even start yeah what is it what is, you know how would you call it justice equity diversity inclusion what is it why does it matter and you know what are the kind of fundamental core concepts of this you know yeah core, I mean, I mean, often people people call it diversity, equity, and inclusion, and but I believe that justice comes first, right? Mm -hmm. That the reason why we do this work within diversity, equity, inclusion is because you want to create a just society, at least attempt to structure the society in a way that actually develops and creates just outcomes, yeah. because. You know, diversity is a, is a given in the sense that the world is diverse. Everything is diverse. Mm. Um, however, what we see in reality is that 
at the top, especially in positions of power, there is a lack of diversity. So there's a lack of representation of the most marginalized people in the world, whether that's people from the global south or women or black people, indigenous people, people of color. Um, you see in the, in the global hegemonic structures that there's not a lot of representation at the top that this economic model and this system um, works on you know, this this idea of quote-unquote whiteness. Mm. And, and what I mean with that is not, oh, your skin color, but what I mean is that it is a product of global injustice that has happened throughout the last 200, 300 years that yeah. has created this artificial separation between people based on their skin color. Mm. You know, that the things that happened in the past that they have an impact on today and that they continue to snowball into something worse and worse. And initiatives like diversity, equity, and inclusion try to provide a, you know, there's this pushback towards that, this 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 acknowledgement that something is actually seriously wrong in the world and we need to do something different. With equity, what we're talking about is how do we design a system that holds into account the differences and the, the backgrounds, but also the different paths that different communities have had to take to get to where they are today. For example, someone in a wheelchair has a different need than someone that can walk. Mm. Someone that has had a, a hard childhood cannot, will not have the same outcome. How do we meet people where they are sure. with the resources that they need to succeed? And especially acknowledging the fact that they've got there through no means of their own, that they got there because of oppression, that oppression held them back and stopped them from really thriving um, in this space. You know, when yeah. you look at the differences between the global north and the global south, um, you know, from access to schooling, access to, to public transport, or, or access to food security, mm. um, these are not a given for people all over the world. Even in Curacao, which is a, sure. is, it's like semi-periphery country, as they like to call it, which is mm. like right in between um, like a northwestern country and like a, a south uh, marginalized country. Yeah. Um, there are many people that are struggling, that they don't have enough to eat, that they don't have enough to drink, that they can't pay for clothes. And what does what type of impact does that have on their personal individual development, but also on the in the on the development of the community yeah. that has to experience that? Totally. And what does that mean in the global context, right? And yeah. you see that some countries are very rich and everybody's smart and everybody's educated. Good for them. Mm. But then other countries are poor and um they don't have access to food and they they're struggling. Sure. And it's not automatic. It's not something that just happens because it happened. It is something that is a consequence of historical realities yes. and powers that be dynamics that still exist to this day. Sure, when, sure. When we look at the oil industry and in, in, in their relationship with Africa, or even in Curacao, mm. when we look at um, who has the financial benefit, who has the financial power within the global order, it's not the people that have been marginalized. It's often mm. the people that have benefited from extraction and have yeah. benefited from oppression. And with oppression, I mean that to the benefit of a few, they have pushed down or held down another group in order to gain either financial means yeah, or... resources. Yeah. Yeah, and accumulate wealth. And yeah. I, th I think there, there's so many threads to play on here and, and I want to kind of go back to this um, to this image of a complete lack of representation at the global level yeah. in positions of leadership in the core systems and structures that really drive our flow of value. And I think obviously we're talking in terms of finance and economy, um, but there, there seems to me be quite an interesting indicator in the stories that we're telling ourselves throughout society, mm. which is that, hey, we're individuals. Yeah. We're motivated by our rational self-interest. Yeah, classic. And this is the providing, you know, the presiding economic theory is that like there's this invisible hand that guides all of our human behavior. Ooh. And and actually it's like 
you know, quite phenomenal that we haven't really updated our economic models based on what we know about, you know, behavior science and how people actually behave that we're not rational, that we're incredibly emotional and that we actually need each other to survive. And I think, you know, the pandemic and obviously climate change and all these other global crises are really forcing us to reevaluate that core human story. And it's fascinating to see the work at IDEO and some of the you know, design thinking research has shown mm-hmm. that actually diversity is the core ingredient for innovation. Yeah. And so there's so many different arguments to really kind of encourage people to look very honestly about you know, the structures of power and who's in these positions of leadership, the representations, and also the access to participate in these systems. But I'm curious, like, what you see in particular in the refi space, how this is playing out in this nascent movement that we have today. Like, what would your sort of read and your snapshot be on our kind of awareness and consciousness about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, and how this is manifesting in the movement that we've built together? It's multi-layered. Um, on the on the bright side, right? I I see a definite desire to look at these issues and to mention them and to bring them up. Mm. Um, And and look, regeneration cannot happen without inclusion. It cannot happen without acknowledging diversity because clearly we are intervening because something is wrong. You know, if something wasn't wrong, this movement would have no need to exist. (laughs) Um, So so, so the, the foundation of the Revive movement is very much grounded in this acknowledgement that the current system is unjust. Mm. That being said, we mirror a lot of the major flaws and the deep flaws of the old system. And simultaneously, we, we think that we are totally independent from them, but we are, again, we, we work in cycles. You know, mm. um, regenerative finance is new, but it's not new <laughs> in the sense that it is a... It is a package, it is an accumulation of different projects and different ideologies that have already existed in the past, from things like the labor movement to the activism movement to um, the climate movement and, and, and new ways of thinking. So, so, so if you would look throughout history, a lot of these things have been done before apart from each other. And we are bringing them, it's like a beautiful amalgamation, yeah. but we have to f- remember that we are also bringing in the flaws yes. and the, the mistakes that these systems have made. And when we think they are separate from, when we think we're separate from them, mm. we basically force ourselves to repeat history. Yeah. And in really tragic ways. Often. Yeah. It's, it's crazy because it, it is happening again and again. And we're like, oh, no, no, no. And we, we got to go fast. And we're yes. going faster and faster. And I'm like, guys, actually, this is the one of the reasons why our current economic system is in shambles. Mm. Our current mm. na- natural order is in shambles because we are going fast, but we're not going deep. Yes. We need to think deeply. We need to feel deeply. We need to develop things in a way that brings people together. And you cannot do that when you're going at a startup pace. Totally. Like, we don't and, like to hear that. Yeah, no, we don't. And this really reminds me of Redemption Dow. Oh, yeah. You know, like, I feel like this was such a quintessential expression of what you just described. I'd be curious to hear, you know, we can spend a few minutes on this, but like yeah. how you saw Redemption Dow emerged. Maybe we can provide a little context. So for those who don't know, um, I guess it was uh, last November, yeah, November 2022, I think it was, um, there was news that uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo was auctioning off uh, huge amounts of land within the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo Basin being one of the most biodiverse and natural capital rich areas in the world. And uh, playing a you know a vital role in the stabilization of our climate and the continued sequestration of carbon, um, and they were auctioning it off to oil companies. And here, you know, some um, very well intentioned, you know, beautiful hearted and talented people in Refi heard wind yeah. of this, and there was this enormous mobilization of you know a lot of the top people in the space saying, "Let's do something about this." Yeah. But along the way, it seemed like we began to you know really commit some of the same exact patterns that you described. Yeah. So I'm curious to get your take on like, yeah, is this a microcosm for the space as a whole? Like what happened and just how, I don't know, how you saw that whole approach? Because I remember when we first spoke about it, you really unpacked so many layers of understanding that I just just didn't see. Yeah, you know, the thing is, right, when we function on panic because that's what it was. It was Mm. panic. It was like, oh Mm. my gosh, there is an urgency and we need to do something now, 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 now. now. Yes. 
even though we don't understand the issue, like, <laughs> we're the people that are living on the ground. What did they think about it? What did they feel about it? So we need to think in systems when it comes to intervening in places, especially a place like Congo, which has a, a historical, you know, a, a very tragic history of mm. deep colonial injustice, you know, mm. by Belgium. Um, when we intervene in these places and we have no connection with the local people we have no idea what we're trying to do and we see conservation as this type of colonial thing where we oh no no we have to protect them from Mm. destroying the nature you know these people that live on the ground are in communion with nature because Mm. they are part of the nature nature of that place that is their land and when we think we can come in and magically like introduce like all this stuff without acknowledging you know there's a reason totally. why this is happening there why these people feel the need to for example um, go into oil and, and and that we have to listen to the voices on the ground when we don't do that and we just go fast because oh no we need the money now mm, mm. we create such a we aggravate the, 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 the damage that has already been done and we bring up these wounds in a place and we, we're not actually doing anything good, right? No, because no, what are we going to do when we have the land? You know, who's <laughs> going to steward it? Who's going to do the work? Like, Yes. And where's the money coming from? Yes. And what is the color of that money? And what are the yeah. expectations? So, yeah. I, and I think this kind of emphasis on crisis leading us to look past history and to look past culture and community and place is a really interesting pattern through the climate crisis. Yeah. Because this is this predominant narrative. You know, On the one hand, we have this story of separateness. Yeah. But on the other hand, we have this, this story of urgency and doom. Yeah. And I think it's been fascinating to see how this is intertwined and created a bit of a blindness yeah, definitely. towards actually what long-term holistic regeneration could look like. And so I'd be curious to hear like what your recommendations are, you know, maybe even speaking to founders in the refi space or founders, you know, building climate projects who really are looking to go deeper yeah. into this story of, you know, one species and build, you know, diverse and inclusive and just organizations. Like what are the steps that people can actually take? What do you recommend? So there's it's again it's layered right so mm. um there's the internal layer and we can we can start there yeah that, mm. that's gonna be a hoot yeah. guys if everybody is tired in your team mm. if everybody is struggling you know you are not modeling regeneration <laughs> you're not doing it like like it's 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 a hard thing to hear because we've embodied capitalism within our system look if we are doing something entirely different we cannot be modeling the same thing the work cannot kill me. It cannot kill me. It cannot kill me because if it kills me, then what is the impact that I am creating in this world? If it comes from a place of total disconnection and total rejection of my needs or rejection of the community's needs in or favor your family's of family's needs, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it has to be holistic. It has to flow. Sure, there are going to be periods where you have to work harder. Of course, that's normal. Hmm. That being said, it cannot be something that you continuously do where everybody is pulling out out of stops to survive, to survive, to survive. And we want to provide communities and we want to provide people hope for a regenerative, balanced, equitable future. It it don't it don't match. That hmm. energy does not match. And 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 we need to look within our teams, what are we doing with the people? How are we communicating with each other? How are we providing space for each other? How are we um, allowing people to to grow into this space? Because if we're doing something that is for the long run, then we need to have that energy to last a long run. You mm. cannot be running a marathon with sprint energy. Yeah, you, you burn out. Yeah. And this is predominant in the space. Yeah. And, and dude, what you were saying really touched me because this, is, this has been my life. Yeah. Like I've been building startups for 16 years under that frenetic pace. And it's incredibly destructive the, and exhausting. The precarity of it all, right? Where like and and, and we'll we'll go a deeper layer. Nobody has a pension, nobody has like sick leave, nobody has vacations. And again, I understand simultaneously, right? Because we're in the startup space that that the system is precarious because the yeah. system has built a reality where we have to struggle and fight within this precarious ecosystem to survive. So I get it, but we need to 
hold that into account. And we need to be self-reflective and critical that actually some things aren't aligning. Maybe it might not. Maybe maybe in this spirit, it's still precarious. But we need to have this vision that actually we're going to this place where we're not going to have this precarity in our organization anymore. Mm. Because the quality that you deliver for people is reflected on the internal state that you have as an individual, but also as a team and a community. That's just how it works. Mm. Layer two would be, um, who are we speaking to on the ground? Who are, who are the voices that we're listening to? Who are we developing for? Mm. Why are we developing for that? And what is the purpose of our development? You know, is it just a magic? Look, conservation can be very colonial because we uh, we believe in this idea. Oh no, we need to protect, um, you know, the animals and the, and the and the plants and the trees from the people. But that's also a very extractive model because you see people as disconnected. You see people mm. as not being a part of this community. While mm. indigenous people, for example, they, they, they see people as an integral part of stewardship of nature. Yeah. And we see that in places like Australia or California right now where there are wildfires. Look, a lot of these places, indigenous people would do controlled burnings of the mm. trees. Mm. And when conservationists came in, they were like, no, that's barbaric. You're destroying the forest. <laughs> But then, Jeez. actually, they were burning the trees that were old, the old brush that was a big fire hazard. And now what we see globally is so much of these wildfires happening because the stewardship of those lands were taken mm. away from indigenous people that actually knew what they were doing to people that wanted to conserve it as though it's a... Look, nature is not a museum. It's not a project. No, it's not. It's not a museum. It's not a project. It's something that we do with each other because we're a part of nature. It is a mm. cycle. It is an ecosystem of interconnected beings. And sometimes things die. Sometimes things have to live. Yeah, it's a um, cycle of and, life. Yeah, and you have to acknowledge that there, it is a holistic project. It is a holistic reality and not something that you can just say, oh, no, no, we're protecting it. You know, let's save the whales or let's mm. save the manatees as though mm. our own choices are not the things that are driving the destruction of these ecosystems. <sighs> So uh, layer one for me, uh, regeneration begins within the internal world, the way that we deal with our own body, our own mind, yeah. our own heart and emotions is you know, a rippling and an expression into our organizations yeah. and into the world around this. Layer two is this really clear reflection upon who are we working with on the ground? What are the regions that we're trying to support? And are we approaching this with a colonial mindset or are we approaching this as being one with nature and really deeply understanding the people and the place yeah. on the ground and being in service of what they need yeah. and what they want? What's Is, is there any more layers onto this? I'm oh, curious to there's, see there's definitely the, the funding layer, right? Yeah, Where, yeah. And, and this is maybe for people in VCs also, right? Like sure, all you, forms of capital yeah, as well. You, you cannot expect the same outcome from a system that is totally different, that, that attempts to be totally different from the current system. Mm. Clearly, the model is not working if the outcomes are total destruction of our biodiversity yeah. and a collapse of our climate. So, so how do you expect, how do you come into this space and expect 400, 500, 900% um, return on investment in like two years without acknowledging that actually this model is toxic? You know, you know, and, and, and this is the big issue with VCs because they expect um, the reality to always continue to exist as it is right mm, now. Mm. And their risk analysis is based on that. The, their risk analysis is based on um, the status quo not changing. Totally. The truth is the status quo is changing. And either you do something now or you miss the boat. Mm. And a lot of them are missing the boat because they're super reluctant. They're like, oh no, but um, the time is not ripe. I mean, when is the time going to be ready? When everything is dead? Yeah, and, and I think there is something shifting here because you know I've had the great pleasure of getting to know you know most of the VCs who've done deals in refi, and I think there is you know a lot of capital that's drying up and people coming to the end of their funds and yeah. people raising again, and I've spoken to one very very experienced VC who actually is consciously raising an entirely different fund based upon a completely different return profile with different LPs specifically to make bets yeah. that are more you know, integrated into holistic outcomes yeah. for people and the planet. 
And so, you know, I give a lot of credit to, you know, conscious capitalists yeah. out there because I think capitalism gets a really bad name. But at the end of the day, we do need this kind of capital that is catalytic, that comes in at an early stage with a very high risk profile. Yeah. Because, you know, this is what really stimulates innovation. And at the same time, I think it's important, as you say, to really push up against VCs who just see this as a market yeah. and just are applying the classic 100x return profile, You know, spread their bets, push the founders and the organizations to these hyper growth curves, yeah. and oftentimes are constructing market environments for this sole purpose of exit. Yeah. And like this for me is really where things are incredibly dangerous and toxic yeah. and why refi has to be so, so careful yeah. because we're dancing with the devil and the soul of capitalism through yes. DeFi. And on the other hand, we're trying to be regenerative. And, you know, there is a big It rubs a bit against each other. Yeah, massively. Um, Huge tension. And, and, and that tension is interesting, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's important to recognize that, or, or at least to, 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 to even be able to, to say that, to even yeah. vocalize that, verbalize that, because it's, it's, it's what we're seeing. Yeah. And furthermore, You know, when, when you're doing all of this funding stuff, right? And we have to reimagine what risk actually is. Mm. Because all of these risk profiles are based, again, on climate not changing. Mm. A mm. lot of these risk profiles are based oh, on the status quo remaining and all of these alternatives. Because, because risk is, me is measured comp in comparison to other things, right? In mm. comparison to other types of investments which are considered safe. Yeah. But in which measure are these investments, for example, in fossil fuels or in housing and in well and in, in property investment, are they considered safe mm. with regards to the climate risk mm. that is increasing right now? So they have a lot of homework to do when it comes to their yeah. risk assessment models because they are not future ready. Mm. And, mm. and and when they are not future ready, you implement this idea that regenerative finance or a lot of these climate investments are riskier because you don't hold into account actually what makes them what makes wow. them safer. And, and also what's highly probable. Yes. Which is rising temperatures, destruction of biodiversity. I mean, it's happening right it, now. This it, summer it, has been unprecedented. It's a, the hottest summer ever recorded. <laughs> like, 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 yo, like this is not just a scenario that you read about in the newspaper or something you, you see, you see, An, an academic ranting about it is a lived reality right, right now. now and if you don't adjust your economic models your financial risk models your investment models you will miss the boat and mm -hmm. again a lot of things are happening with, with capital natural capital valuation um, new laws are coming in like they are not informed about the new legislative procedures mm -hmm. that are happening and things that are happening in the background and they're just focused on a very narrow understanding of what is happening mm. and and that's a problem on that layer mm. um, so 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 again there's there's the internal layer right there's a community layer there's the the funding mechanism and and we need to also diversify our funding mechanisms because yes. if we're only getting money from organizations and no 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 bad to them right no no jabs towards them because a lot of these people are doing their best totally. and they're and they're and they're functioning in an existing model that is sometimes at odds with our reality totally. but public funding is also something we need to work on and mm. we need to focus on getting more public and ngo funding public private models of 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 funding our projects because they are doing what is good for society and communities. Mm, mm. And if we want to do, and, and I was talking to you yesterday about it, this global um, mm -hmm. reality, right? Where it's all local organizations, local corporations working together globally. If we are really attempting to do that, then we have to also look at other mechanisms of funding that acknowledge that, you know, from crowdfunding to, um, you know, public, to public, public systems, public banks and grants and subsidies. And, and these things are there, but they have not been our focus efforts because our focus, again, is more in the startup circle. Sure. Yeah, and which can often be totally abstracted from those communities where yeah. the you know public and philanthropic capital is so deeply rooted. Yeah. And there's a strong social capital required to be able to access those streams Definitely. of funding. And I think this is a core part of our thesis at ReFiDAO around building these local nodes that are meeting regularly every month yeah. with the leaders across public, private, and third sector institutions to say, hey, like, yes, the Web3 space has some incredibly powerful digital coordination yeah. tools that can solve some of these complex 
crises yeah. that you know nations and corporations can't face in their current form. But at the same time, if we're not anchored to the real people and the real institutions on the ground that actually need these yeah. tools to deploy capital with publicly verifiable impact, then what difference are we going to make if we're just running around in the cloud? Yeah. And so I'd be curious to get your take on this trend. You've obviously... You know, seeing the emergence of Refi DAO as Refi Spring and all of our network of events, primarily yeah. in emerging markets, merge, and we, you know, envisioned of this idea of you know a network society or Balaji's take on the network state. How do you see this trend in particular playing in with this global movement of regeneration? And what do we need to be you know conscious and aware of as we look at you know the systems and the structures that we're building and you know who's participating in this? I think what's very beautiful is that it is a local is a local organization, right? Where mm. you are bringing in all of these leaders um, all over the world together in these nodes and people that are already invested into community. And I, I see, especially the work that is happening with with, with Refi Dao in the global south and in mm. like South America, especially. Mm. Yeah, I see that a lot of different voices are being represented, which is a very beautiful thing, right? Totally. We are suddenly. Um, this this whole capital or, or access to capital world is not just something that is so far away from from your own reality that you can you know that you're deploying capital that that capital and um, opportunities are being deployed to these communities to be able to make that change on the ground and bringing in the type of cooperation especially between public private yes. and, and, and NGOs and individuals so that's actually a good thing I think that mm. that is mm. very visionary for how the future is going to work it's already it's already making a change right now mm. especially because there is this alignment and coordination towards this greater value this shared um, purpose that can make a difference so I really commend refi mm. Dao, mm. Um, for that 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 initiative that you'll and that mm. risk that you all are so. taking it's powerful mm. and yeah I mean I think the, the challenge will always be that we do not get swallowed up. Mm. You know, by by corporatist interest or that um, tokenization isn't a thing, right? Because it's nice if you have activists on board, but if they're only used to kind of whitewash or greenwash mm. um, what we're doing, then that's a red flag. Yeah. So we have to be intentional with the designing of the governance. We have to be yes. intentional with um, how do we deal with conflict and do we have the space for disagreement? Do we have a space for reconciliation? Do we yeah. have a space for um, dealing with, um, you know, the uncertainties and, and the, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the the, the abrasive tension that mm. we can sometimes experience when collaborating. Yeah. Mm. And and that's 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 something where inclusion, equity, diversity, and justice comes in because again, DE and I is often seen, especially in spaces like this, it's seen very much with a suspicious eye, right? It's like, mm. oh no, it's just those those woke people mm. Um, mm. trying to like tell me that I'm bad or something like that. And it's there's there's a lot of misconceptions regarding that mm. because they see it only through this lens of, oh, we just have to do representation for representation's sake. Yeah, um, yeah. But if you're regenerating the world, everybody has to be on board and you have to hold into account power dynamics. Mm. Um, what is it to gain the world but to lose your soul? And often you see it in the global centers of wealth where people are so rich and powerful and they have everything, but they're so unhappy. Deeply miserable. And so disconnected from their own selves and from reality and everything that they create has that deep sadness, deep emptiness within it. So it's not working. Mm. And, and and inclusion means that everybody works together, that everybody is connected together. But justice also means that we acknowledge that we need to build systems that serve people better yeah. and that restore and, and regenerate what has been broken down from the stakes in the past. Um, and, and that's when, you know, it's... It's that's where conversations like things like controversial things like reparations come in, mm. or, or or things like um, you know acknowledging um, how the impact of white supremacy has developed um, and impacted people's lives, um, especially in the global south. And it you know your skin color or your identity doesn't define your behavior or your mm. actions, mm. but what it often does do is it creates 
chances or it creates opportunities mm. or lack of opportunities that either further you on or stop you from gaining access to certain things, especially if you're living in the global north, but also if you're living in the global south because mm. the resources aren't there for you. Sure, the opportunity. Yeah, and I think there's this interesting palette emerging around redefining wealth, as you described. Yeah. You know, the outcome of the systems that we've designed is you know an incredibly high concentration of wealth in a few hands, yeah. when those hands aren't satisfied, yeah. and it really just continues to further this consumptive economic engine that's just looking for more, but actually more for more sake doesn't result in the satisfaction that people are looking for. And rather, if we can really recognize that by including the most diverse range of stakeholders that we possibly can and empowering them with full autonomy to make decisions about the allocation of these resources, yeah. I think we can see not only you know a more fair and stable economic environment, but also like true forms of beauty yeah. that we haven't seen before. And I think this is something I'm really excited as the regenerative finance movement continues to grow. And you know, like you said, there's huge uptake for these local nodes in Latin America. You know, these people are incredibly capitally efficient. The resource that they use, they use very wisely. And they really demonstrate to, you know, people outside like, hey, this is the standard by which you should be holding and stewarding this wealth that you've been given. Yeah. Because we are on a very limited time frame. Yeah. And we do live on a finite planet. And actually, we should really be making the most of every single moment, every single dollar that we have to really make you know, this planet a better place for all. Yeah. And so I think there is you know, an amazing kind of, um, I don't know, like a, a ping pong and a back and forth that we can have as we explore transitioning these economic systems to a more you know, diverse and equitable and just state that we're really learning from deep wisdom that we severely need to make this transition. You know, it's not just a nice thing on the side, like this is integral. Yeah. The, the combination of these cultures is the only way that we make this forward. Yeah, I mean, this This is the foundation thing about regenerating because where are you regenerating towards, Yeah. right? And, and, and it's a deep value question. What are the values that underlie this movement? You know, because yeah. what, what is, because regeneration implies that something is broken, right? Mm. That something has mm. decayed. Yeah. Um, and, and, yes. and you're regenerating something towards a specific goal. What mm. is that goal, right? It, is it justice? Is it is it mm. equity? Is it... Is it freedom? What does that mean yeah, um, in nice. a lived reality, in an embodied experience? Especially for people, because we love throwing around values like, oh, we need to coordinate, oh, um, decentralization. There's, there's be- there, there are beautiful values, but they are secondary values. Yeah. Because you decentralize with a purpose in the sense yes. that something is more democratic, mm. that, that more voices are represented, that we have more just outcomes. You... Um, I don't know, autonomy is, is also beautiful, but it is implied that this autonomy creates just results, that, that this autonomy provides dignity towards individual stakeholders and actors that they all can function in a way that is in alignment with their own selves. Mm. So, so, so we have to deepen the conversation even more, right? Not just saying these things like buzzwords, which is nice. It's, it, it sounds very nice. It rolls off the tongue. <laughs> but what does it truly mean when it comes to people's lives, when it comes mm. to nature and when it comes to the order that we live in. So one of the toxic things about the current order, right, is that it's consumption-driven, number one. Mm. But that the value of um, individual freedom is not tempered with anything else. That that, that as an individual, I have the freedom to destroy everything I want because it's my choice. Mm. But it presumes that there is a totally unlimited reality that exists where everybody has the full freedom to do anything and they are not constrained by their behaviors by anything else. And it's not mm. true. It's mm. literally not true. It does not reflect reality whatsoever. Yeah, it doesn't. So when we start looking at our values on a deeper level, do we recognize that, you know, actually some values that we hold are problematic? And are we willing to divest or let go of these values that do a disservice to our communities, do a disservice to ourselves? And I think there is hope, right? Mm. Because there is hope and, and, and there is this promise that as we let go of the things that we that do not serve us, what we have to gain is greater than yes. what we are losing. Yes. I think that's the promise of regeneration, you know, that even as we are in this urgent, quote unquote, state, you know, that that what we have to gain in the future, that the potential for harmony and for for change and for, for, for purposefulness and for connection mm. um, 
will overcome and surpass the current comfort that we think we have because totally. the comfort that we have is nice but if everybody's burned out and everybody's depressed it's Doesn't not that us. great yes yeah it's so true and i think there's there's this interesting idea here of us like espousing values on the one hand but living out entirely different values on the other what what do you see like as an honest account you know because it feels like there's a pretty massive mismatch in terms of what we say we value and then how a lot of the space actually acts and behaves oh we love that we really love that i mean it it makes us feel good about ourselves no 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 i believe in this thing i believe mm. in making the world a better place at the same time you know how do you how are you treating your workers mm. or at the same time how are you um Connecting to actual people and to conflicts and, and dealing with the uncertainties and, and maybe mm. people's different periods of life. You have to have a coherence with that. And as people in general, we're very bad at that. Mm. Um, so, so we can say that we believe in something and do something entirely different, which is why this journey towards regeneration is also a deep personal journey because it is this human journey of alignment. Yes. Am I aligned with what I am saying? Am I fully integrated with myself? Am I yes. authentic with my values? Mm. Um, and as a as a space that is being born, right, um, that is the challenge for us. Do we want to mature into this deep alignment with ourselves that our actions are coherent with our words? Or do we not want to do yeah. that? And obviously, um, this is reality. So there will always be some incongruity. Of course. But can you admit that? Yeah. You know, <laughs> can you sit with that Which, feeling saying, yeah. Oh, it's actually not, I, you know, I'm saying this, but actually I'm doing something differently and that sucks. And, and also the hardest part sometimes is recognizing that what you want and what you sought after is not actually what you need. Yeah, yeah. Reassessing, reflecting, reevaluating. And it requires not only courage, but consciousness, like true self-awareness. And we don't really live in an environment that's conducive to no. clear thinking, yeah. to contemplation to clear observation even. Because we judge each other so harshly. But also it's so frenetic. Yeah. You know, like we've built this distraction machine. I remember when I was first getting into the Web3 space, like it's so hard to get things done because there's a thousand channels. There's so many notifications. Everyone's on all the time. There's events and conferences every single month all over the world. Like everything is, you know, buzzing and vibrant, which is great and yeah. amazing. But I also think we need to carve out some of these really intimate, safe, and yeah. contemplative spaces to have hard conversations yeah. with ourselves, yep. first and foremost. Definitely. To really deeply listen and go within and to observe the world around us clearly. And and to take bold and radical action. Yeah. And like I think now is really the best time to do it. You know, during the bear as enthusiasm and the hype cycle is waned and price is waiting. Yeah. You know, like this is the time, man. So I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on like what people listening can do who've resonated with this particular story that you've shared, who maybe have felt a little stirred up by some yeah. of the things that you've said. Like, What are actions that people can take to go deeper on this journey? Again, I'll, I'll do it in layers. I think on an individual level, self-reflecting, right? Um, why am I doing what I'm doing? What am I actually doing? What are my values, my core values? And in which measure do my values align with my actions? And be honest about yourself. And in in at the same time that you're honest with yourself, also know you are loved and you mm. are worthy and you mm. you have dignity, independent of whether you are in alignment or not. Yes. Um, I think I think one of the biggest challenges for people is to be able to acknowledge that they're doing something that is wrong while still holding themselves um, in love. Mm. You are worthy at the same time as you have done some things that are crap. You know, I always say, you know, it's garbage can, not garbage cannot. <laughs> um, you, you can do it. You can do it. it, it it's fine. You, we are here to learn and we are here to grow. And, and with this honesty and with this mm. kindness that we have mm. for ourselves and for our community, we can reflect on it in a way that is objective, but also in a way that holds into account, actually, I didn't know that. Mm, or actually, okay. the urgency. And, and and then you can reevaluate and you can change course. Mm. So I think that's the first step on the individual level. On a, I just want to touch on that briefly, which is so interesting. As a parent, you know, this really is the ultimate challenge, yeah. is to create that condition of unconditional love for your child, despite whatever the behavior is. Yeah. And that safety really does enable such deep and clear introspection 
and connection with self because like you said, no matter whether you've acted out of alignment yeah. with your truest values, you were still loved. Yes. And I think so many of the leaders today in positions of authority have not received that. No, there's a deep insecurity. It's driving all of it. It really is. And I think, you know, that's where I, I love uh, Livia from Giveth and Common Stack yeah. talking about bringing love into economics. Yeah, it is, it is about love. It is about love. Even, even in conversations like things like racial injustice, mm. you see this deep insecurity when, when people are challenged about it, mm. they automatically either shut down Super or they go defensive. on the attack because they're like, oh no, you are worthy even when you did those things. Yes, yes. That being said, that doesn't mean that those things were good, but it also doesn't mean that you are something that should be thrown away. Mm. You know, mm. we all are in this journey together towards restoration, towards regeneration, mm. towards a higher purpose. And that means that we have to sharpen ourselves. Mm. And we sharpen ourselves, we're being honest, and we sharpen ourselves by by holding ourselves accountable, not in a way that breaks us down, mm. but in a way that galvanizes us towards doing something better. Uh -huh. um, and, and it's possible, it's possible. And, and that's why I feel um, of, of, often this conversation on DEI and J is, you know, it's captured into a way that is extremely negative and, mm. and driven into this way, oh, so you hate all white people, oh, so you hate all men. And I'm like, no, definitely mm. not. Like, are you listening? <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. P because people are much more focused. Their insecurities are being mm. challenged. And we need to have a way of holding our insecurities yeah. in a way that, that, that you know, reparentification, right? This idea mm. of you are, you are now your own parent. Yes. What is it that you need to grow? And that when you embrace that vulnerability, you will not betray yourself. Mm. That when you embrace that vulnerability, um, you will hold yourself and that there is love for you and that there is grace for you when you are willing to do it. And some people might not be gracious, but mm. you know that what you're doing is good. So to have that self-compassion for yourself mm. in this path is, is so important to move on forward to the next thing. Mm. And, and, and that you will not be disappointed. That, and, and that's a faith thing, right? That's a, you have faith that, that as we do our good work, that it will be rewarded in due time if yes. we do not give up. Yes, and it's that long, steady marathon pace that you described at the beginning that we really need to inhabit because this is a multi-decade journey. Yeah. This isn't a sprint. This is just one cycle of many. And, and we will win. And we will and win. And we will win. And you have to have the confidence that this is good work and that mm. we will overcome. Yes. Because if you don't, then why are we even why are we doing, doing what this? we're doing? Totally. And I think you highlighted something very interesting about there seeming to be a lack of the end state the story of where this resolves after regeneration has run its course. Yeah. And we're not in a regenerative you know, pursuit anymore because everything has been regenerated. Yeah. And we're living in an incredibly bountiful ecosystem yeah. where people are coexisting with the planet, where traditional wisdom and modern science are weaving together towards the systems that actually take care of one another and can cultivate beauty in all forms of life. Yeah. And I think for me, this, this sense and even a belief that this is inevitable really does remove the shackles of this urgency. Yeah. And also allow us to listen very deeply about what we are actually uniquely gifted to yeah. contribute to this. And I think this is definitely something coming up for me around, you know, my role in all this because, you know, you come into a movement and it's like I'm wearing the same, you know, suit that I've always worn. I'm a yeah. founder, you know. Yeah. I build I build organizations. And yet you come into a DAO and it's like you're just a node in the network. Yeah. And you're trying to build something that really does empower people all over the world to step up and take action. And it's a completely different skill set. Yes. And I think, you know, I'm really interested and curious to see how these local nodes, not only in Refi DAO, but also in other organizations, you know, create this kind of microcosm yeah. of of justice and of diversity at the smallest level and how these can onboard new organizations and new projects, yeah. almost like you know a Petri dish of experimentation. Because really what we're working with is culture Definitely. at the end of the day. So um, I'm excited about where this goes, man. I'm curious to know what's, like, what's top of mind for you. What are you most excited about in this obviously hard market time? Yeah. Is there any projects or people or stories that are just really standing out and shining to you as you know, something that you really want to put your faith in and believe in as in the months and years to come? 
and I love the work that is being done, especially now, you know, mm. from the people at Region Network, the people mm. at Collectivo themselves, mm. Mm. Um, but also people like the Blockchain Socialist. He just released yes. a new book. I think I think there is hope that that what we're creating here, right, mm. is above and beyond just tech, right? The yes. tech is nice, but it is a tool that we use in in service of something that is greater, mm. and that when we start interweaving this 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 awareness and this technological development with actual people and actual communities, as mm. things will start to shift, and we're mm. seeing it on the ground, right, where people having are having more opportunities. So, with the work that we did with Collectivo, we gave out grants to a lot of local organizations and individuals. So you saw people lives being improved on the ground yeah. and the more that this happens right the more that you see that that it becomes an integral part of communities and it, it becomes mainstreamed right mm, where mm. it is something that we do as part of communities so we're moving back mm. in history to the, the age of cooperatives and stuff like that we're just doing it digitally mm. I always see you know a lot yeah, of these DAOs are just digital cooperatives they really are yeah. um, it, it, there's not a lot of big difference except that oh no we see every vote on chain it's nice it's cool mm. it also provides transparency and accountability which makes it easier for us to make larger decisions and to control things mm. um and that could serve as an opportunity also for policymakers, right? Where especially things. So I I was in this committee. I'm advising the European Commissioner mm. on International Partnerships on Youth. So if they integrate things like blockchain technology and regenerative practices into that, you can have a way where you can hold people accountable while yes. not having to create that added extra load of paperwork. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so it's making things simpler if we are willing to actually do the work in messaging. And, and informing and reaching out to people on their level yes. because oft, I, I feel sometimes we're very siloed off. Yes. They're like, we have our own little language and, you know, we're shilling it to the moon, which is nice. Again, mm. it, it's important to have like your own community thing that yeah. makes you feel involved. Like you belong. And, yeah, exactly. That being said, who are you doing this for? Mm. Right? You're doing this for a majority of people. We cannot be creating the same apps for the same people um, without expanding it to people that actually need it. Yes. Um, and, and for example, in Curacao, like 50% of the people are unbanked. So our project has an actual added value for these people or at least a hope mm. for this added value for of these people. Well, it's there. It's just whether they can access it. Yeah. And, 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 and so more and more that we think about it, are, are we need to be adaptive mm. and we need to be um, community driven and community aware and ha speak to the people and provide the needs that they need and also the assurances that they have for how these things work for example for safety yeah. um, because for example we might we might value the anonymity um, a lot and you know this this personal sovereignty but maybe for some of them they're like actually I'm scared to send my money to some the, the wrong person and then it's all lost Understandably. because they don't have that much money where they can just lose like two eat and then everything is fine <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and we live in a space um, where a lot of people are in that position. I'm not in that position. No, no. You know, I, if I lose to eat, oh my God, that's yeah. a crisis. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and for, and, and so then we have to really understand what is it that is actually at the core mm. of this movement. Do we really want more people or do we just want this to be like an exclusive little club? That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. That's Do we it. just want that? Yeah, it's an it's an honest evaluation. And at the end of the day, like these are networks yeah. that rely upon new nodes being introduced, new relationships being formed. And so I think, you know, there is there's an incredibly volatile but bright path ahead, especially as we get regulatory certainty. Yeah. Especially as we make incremental user experience improvements and as we really focus our attention on onboarding people yeah. who can actually benefit from the use of these tools and whose lives can really be fundamentally transformed. And this is why I was so, you know, inspired to hear from Alejandro Rifa Medellin the other day. Oh, nice. You know, they run these activations where they're getting people into Web3, but they're also picking up plastic or planting yeah. trees. They do them together. Yeah. And this to me is so profound because not only does somebody have possibly their first experience, you know, doing something, um, you know, in a community, in active service, but they're also now being onboarded to a new set of tools. And I heard a story of, you know, a, a young gentleman um, getting his first job as a result of this through you know learning how to code and Amazing. that these can be really powerful transformative levers to take people from places that 
you know, may not be flourishing with opportunities, connect them to a global network where the opportunity yeah. is the baseline. Yeah. And whether you're in the Bay or you're in Berlin, you can still work remotely if you've got the right skills yeah. and you've got the right attitude. And so I think this story of hope and including people from all types and walks of life into this vision of regeneration yeah, is, is really the path forward. And so I really appreciate you, man, standing bravely amidst... Yeah, I think a, a, a massive wall of counterculture. You know, there's a lot of blindness in this space and a lack of awareness. And it feels like you're doing it with a huge amount of heart as well. You know, there's no finger pointing in your voice. And I think this kind of invitation to self-compassion as we look deeply and reflect is, you know, possibly the most powerful combination that we need in order to to see clearly and overcome for the next step. So um, I feel like we're definitely getting to the end of our time together here, um, Gilberto, but I wanted to ask if there was anything that I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about, anything you want to dive into. Mm, that's a good question. I mean, I just want to reiterate, um, again, this uh, aspect of self-compassion, right, where... This change is happening on the ground. There are people that are doing this work. Um, our purpose should be to include and to expand and to to grow this movement into a global movement that mm. provides this value mm. for people. Um, through diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, we again reiterate and and bring forward that that this work is a work of community, that this mm. work is a work of changing the dynamics of the global order into an order that serves people, into yeah. an order that, that restores the land, but also restores our relationship with the land and with each other. And that after that, you know, the universe is our oyster. Mm. The, the, the problem that I see globally right now is that we're so focused on a lot of these other things, external things. Oh, yeah, we're going to space. That's nice. But imagine what we could accomplish if we all work together, if we mm. were all in a good state, if we, if we actually leverage the value and the quality and the ideas and the beauty of all of these people that are not mm. there yet. Yeah. Like what would the world look like? And, and just imagine that and feel that. And, and then you know that we have some work to do and we can get there yes, if we're we willing. And, and, and I'm so grateful for you. I'm mm. so grateful for this work that you're doing, Thanks, that you're bringing forward, you know, with your heart, with your with your presence, with your, your purpose. You know, it, it it is refreshing. It is refreshing. It's what we need. Like I come from another, I come from another space. I come from the NGO, the mm. activists and the policy space. But even within this community, I, I noticed that there is this movement happening. Yes. And we are evangelists. We are messengers in bringing this to the wider space. Not just the technology, right? Yeah. Because the technology is not, um, it, it is peripheral to, to the purpose, right? Mm. The purpose is the first thing. And these tools provide that. And that can can help us to get there, but mm. we have to be honest, and we have to be willing, and we have to show heart and be courageous. Yeah. And I think it's time for all of us, especially for the founders, but also for, um, you know, the funders, mm. you know, to be courageous into this world that you are changing. The world is moving fast, mm. but we can choose to move intentionally, mm. not slow or, or or fast, but intentionally, and 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 with regards to. The systems that we've created and, and and recognizing, you know, am I redeploying the same systemic yeah. failures or am I doing something different? And I believe that we can. And some of us are already doing some things different. Mm. We need to keep ourselves sharp. Yeah. Thanks, man. <laughs> it's been such an awesome time on the show. How can people get in touch who resonate with your story? Uh, what's the best way to get in contact with you? I mean, you can send me an email at gilberto at colectivo.co. You can um, hit me up on LinkedIn or hit me up on um, Instagram. Um, like, I'm, I'm all yours. I'll share, the, I'll share the details with you and then you can Amazing. add it in the, in the description. Awesome. Check out the show notes for those listening. Um, thank you so much, Gilberto. It's been an absolute pleasure, bro. And uh, hopefully this is the first conversation of many, man. I think we got a, a long road ahead of us and I'm glad that we both got our marathon shoes on. Woo, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs>